jobs in the other profession. I'd like to again thank Microsoft for the meeting space and also one more time thank uh, Joyce and Compella for the refreshments. Uh, I don't see them right now, but they're going to be uh, here after the meeting. So if you are looking for uh, any sort of position, go ahead and, and uh, talk to them and see what's out there. They have 20 positions available. Also, uh, they made these drawing forms available. If you don't have one, they're on the back table. They've got a number of prizes that we're going to be drawing for at the end of the meeting, so I'd invite you to fill out their form and submit the information. So, let's go ahead and get started. Um, tonight's speaker is Kevin Free. He has been working on the compiler for nine plus years, almost ten years. And uh, he's going to talk tonight about exceptions implemented on the 32 and 64 bit compilers. And this is coming straight from the source given that he's working on it so long. So, welcome, Kevin. Tools team in the uh, actually it's the Phoenix organization, not Visual C++. Uh, we split Phoenix. Actually, there, we had a talk uh, from Andy Ayers on the Phoenix Phoenix team. They're a new team that's doing code generation technologies in the future. Um, and there's my blog. I have all sorts of random stupid things about APIs and accept handling on there. Um, so the, this talk actually I've given this talk twice before. Once to a group inside Microsoft regarding performance and once to the Longhorn Server Developers Conference. And the reason I've done this talk, um, the reason I kind of wrote the original, did the original slideshow was because there's this kind of very emotional argument about exception handling and C++. Um, you, you, tend to, you tend to hear a lot of uh, just opinion-based arguments, and you can have whatever opinion you want. I don't care what your opinion is. I wanted to allow people to have enough information so that they could um, cut through personal opinions and figure out how much things really cost and what, what makes sense for them individually. Um, the pros of exception handling I've heard, by the way, in all my slides I say EH for exception handling because I've done this for like five or six years of my life. Oh, do I need a mic? Is that better? Is it on? There we go. Is that better? Okay. Right. Sorry about that. Um, so a lot of the arguments that I've heard for exception handling, you have um, centralized error handling, uh, your code tends to be more robust, um, it can be more readable, uh, the cons, oh, it can make people kind of ignore error conditions. Um, error, error recovery can be difficult because you have to figure out where the right place is to put your handlers. And it does enable abuse of exceptions, and I'll, I'll get into that one because that's kind of my own pet peeve. Um, so anyway, the, really the summary of the pros and cons, though, is they can all be dealt with. You can have code convention enforcement issues, code reviews. Um, if you have a good initial architecture, you can either use exception handling or not use exception handling, and you'll generally be fine. Um, the upfront design matters a heck of a lot more than, you know, did you choose to use this particular language feature or not? So that's generally why this turns into an emotional argument, uh, because either way can work. What's that? The stakes are so low. Yeah, exactly. The stakes are low. You know, there are solutions with or without. It's just a tool um, to solve a problem. There are multiple tools for this problem. Um, the biggest reason I hear not to use exception handling, though, is that it makes my code too slow. Um, this is probably true. Sometimes it's true anyway. And if it's always true, there's a good chance that you're abusing exception handling. Um, the EH performance, though, how fast it is to um, enter a try block to construct an object that has exception handling um, side effects to enter a catch, you know, to throw an exception, to catch an exception. Um, that really depends on your your uh, C++ runtime, the CPU architecture you're running on, and the OS you're running on. And this isn't just a matter of is it a Microsoft operating system or Linux or whatever. Um, actually, Win32 and Win64 have completely different um, performance characteristics. So you really can't look at your C++ source code and, and reason about any sort of performance characteristics if there's exception handling in it, unless you understand the environment in which that code's gonna be running. Um, and again, I mean, deciding this really, you need to understand more about your team than you do um, generally about you know, how it works on that 
you know, on the OS that you're running, on the chip that you're running. Um, so to cut through all the emotional stuff, I want to get right to code quality, how this affects the assembly that we generate. I'm a, I'm a back-end guy, I build app assembly from, I don't deal with parse trees, we get, we get stuff that we just translate to AMD64 or x86 or Itanium, and I, that's the level at which I can understand and I can say this is a fact and this is, this is opinion. So I want to just ex explain facts very, very uh, bluntly. Um, I kind of qualify the costs in, in uh, four or five different buckets. There's kind of a usage penalty. Um, what's the overhead of just having a constructor and a destructor, or having a try with a catch, even if no exceptions occur? How much does that cost you? Um, so how much does, does it cost to enter a try? How much does it cost to clean up your, you run your, run your uh, C++ destructors? Um, Microsoft has an extension to C called Structured Exception Handling that was implemented uh, before C++ exceptions were standardized um, called, uh, that, that used this underscore, underscore, try, and underscore, underscore, finally syntax. And I do mention that throughout, though I don't know how many people use that. It's used inside Microsoft, and most driver developers use it. Um, are there actually app developers that use this outside of Microsoft? You do? Okay. You catch them. Yeah. Yeah, it, that is how you handle uh, um, resource issues on in, in the Windows platform. So, um, okay, so those are kind of uh, so the usage penalty. Then you have cleanup costs. Then there's optimization constraints. So, what uh, what things could a compiler do if you weren't using the exception handling model that you're using, or what what could the compiler do if you weren't using destructors, that sort of thing. And then there's also the cost of actually handling an exception. And um, if you're really concerned about how much it costs to handle an exception, uh, that's probably not a good design decision. Exceptions are named exceptions for a reason. They shouldn't be the norm in your normal program flow. Uh, that's not the attitude in, in a lot of the managed language scenarios. I know Java and C Sharp tend to use exceptions more as kind of alternative return values. C++, really, that's not generally considered good design. Um, I wish I, I wish I actually had the quote. Bjarna was here uh, five or six years ago, and and um, he was he was really salient about the fact that exceptions should be exceptional. They should not be. Um, ever, they should never occur in normal program uh, situation. Um, so I, I did want to briefly mention structured exception handling. Uh, so there, the EH tax for structured exception handling is very similar to C++ exception handling on Windows. Structured exception handling, because it was around before, we actually use that to implement a lot of the C++ exception handling mechanisms, so there's a lot of commonality here. Um, on x86, all functions with structured exception handling contain a complex prolog and epilog. There's a set of instructions in the pro in, before you start executing any of your code in a function that has to run if you have any structured exception handling construct on x86. Um, for x64, the, the AMD64 and Intel EM64T platform, there's no cost to the function itself. You can, if you, if you uh, just the fact that you have an object in your function, or if you have a try catch, um, stepping into the function doesn't take any additional instructions. For C++, um, x86 is, this, is the same. You have this complex prolog and epilog. Um, for x86 or for x64, we do have one additional. There's a single element on the stack that's allocated and initialized to a um, to negative two. So there's a, a single instruction penalty and a four byte stack usage. Um, that 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 is never used inside the function. And I'll talk about that a little, in a little bit more detail later on. So um, that's just kind of how much it costs to step into your function. Once you're in your function and you have a try catch in it. Um, there, there's also a tax, um, tax around stepping into a try block. So if you have a try cache, yes? Well, what do you mean by uh, if a function has some exception uh, handling in it? Uh, does it mean that uh, if, if you turn on exception handling as a compiler switch, then every function will have additional okay, exceptions? So, or? so the question was, what I mean by if a function has exception handling in it? Um, is it just a compiler flag, or is it, uh, you know, just if it has exception handling in it? This is just if it has exception handling in it. So if your function somewhere in, you know, nested in three levels of ifs has a try catch or has an object with a constructor in it, or an object that requires a destructor, that's actually the, the, the trick. You have to be able to invoke your destructors 
if there's an exception. So if that exists anywhere in the function on x86 for Windows, you will have a set of instructions in the prologue of that function. Um, just, just throwing the compiler flag doesn't do anything to functions with no exception handling. Um, okay, so for entering a protected region, either a try block or the beginning of an object lifetime that has a destructor, on x86, you have to update a variable on the stack to say, uh, we have a state map that says what's live and what's dead. So, so when you construct an object, um, we have to flag and say, oh, we've got an object that's live, and if an exception occurs, it needs to be destroyed. Um, the, our compiler has two modes. One is EHS, and this is the C++ um, conformant mechanism. C++ doesn't say anything about how to handle stack overflows or AVs or divide by zeros or anything like that. Um, C++ is at the language level just understands throws. So if you, if you compile and throw the EHS flag, that says just handle C++ thrown exceptions. If you take an AV, you won't catch them with a catch block, your destructors won't, won't be run, um, and you're, you're just out of luck. Um, EHA is our flag that says, okay, if you take an AV, allow a catch to catch that and run, and run all your destructors. So um, EHA and EHS are kind of two flavors, and generally you'll, you'll need one or the other. Um, most people generally wind up using EHA because they want to be able to handle stack overflows or AVs and make sure that they close their files and free their resources. Um, for x64, there's generally no cost unless the bound, right before a try block or right after a try block, you have a call. And this, this is kind of, it's a, it's a really weird requirement, but if you have a call, you have to have a no-op. So there's just a one byte, uh, one byte cost to code size, and oh, current architectures do actually fill the pipeline, so you get a bubble in your pipeline. But it's, it's, uh, it is cheaper than x86. Um, unfortunately, this scenario is pretty common for C++ <coughs> exception handling, because a constructor, you call the constructor, and then you're in, a, in your protected region where now you have a, an object that needs to be destroyed. So you have to put a no up after every call to constructors if you have a destructor. Um, so if you don't have exceptions, so your program is well written, you have to clean up your objects. Uh, you have to call your finally clauses. In structure exception handling on x86, um, all that code that's inside your finally block is stuck into a sub function and we call that thing and return. So you have a call right overhead. And there's some, there's some other issues because of that. We have to do register allocation a little di bit differently. And you will see just some different code gen aside from the call right overhead. Um, for C++ exception handling, a destructor can actually be inline. And so if you have a very small destructor, um, you'll actually get no overhead at all for leaving that, aside from the state update that I mentioned before. You're changing from inside a try block or, a, or an object lifetime to outside. So you just have your your uh, state update on the, on the stack. For x64, the finally clause, which is this sub that we actually inline that into the function, so there's no cost there. And C++, it's the, um, it's the same for x86 as x64. We we'll inline those destructors, and uh, you can completely eliminate the cost of, of uh, using that try block for cleaning up your objects. Um, so inside Microsoft, and, Com programming, H results are used everywhere. Uh, so when people start talking about optimization constraints, the first thing they start talking about is, oh, with try blocks, I can't do this or I can't do that, and I want to use H results instead. Um, so for H result uh, consideration, um, I actually later on I'll show you some examples of code that handles the exact same, does the exact same stuff in C++, C with try, um, try accept and try finally, and standard C or C++ with H results. Um, if you're going to write code that checks return values for error conditions, and you're going to try and compare that to exceptions, you need to make sure that you check all the same places. So um, just because we have to constrain the optimizer, um, that's not, that doesn't really mean that the, that the return code stuff would wind up really looking any better. If it doesn't look pretty much the same, that's because you're not going to catch all the same errors. Um, all the, the edges in your flow graph that exist with exceptions should exist when you're checking return codes. Um, basically, you know, if, if you were gonna maybe throw an exception there, 
and writing good, secure, you know, error, error, uh, error recovery code, you have to have the edges in your flow graph anyway. Um, so the mandatory optimization constraints are kind of defined by the language standard. Um, there's there's uh, certain things that you just cannot do if you have if you're inside of a try catch. There's certain things that you can't do because your destructors have to be invoked in the right order. Um, you can't if if you're uh, if you take an exception, you can't uh, invoke your destructors in different orders. So there's all sorts of ordering issues having to do with the language and the implementation of exception handling. Um, I'll also talk about the optimization constraints in our current compiler, um, VC8, uh, part of what's the studio, Visual Studio 2005, right? Um, that I gotta remember, we have lots of different versions. Um, that's the current optimizer. It's been it's it's been migrated from the VC5 code base, so this is the same compiler. In VC8, we did a lot of work to um, reduce the cost of exception handling along the kind of implementation weaknesses. We fixed a lot of our holes and really do a better job of optimizing with exception handling. Um, so the, the code that I'm going to show you, I'm not going to bother showing you 7.1 or 7.0 um, code. That code generally looks a little bit worse. Um, so I already mentioned this before, the C++ language standard doesn't actually specify anything about non-thrown exceptions. If you don't see the expression throw, you know, my object, there's nothing in the language standard about it. Yes? I'm not sure if you're going to get into this later, but uh, on the x64, for if you have any exception handling in there, is the compiler required to generate a stack print for it with EBP so the stack can be locked? Um, I, I will get into that exact thing. That's okay. that's uh, exactly what I've done for many years, is that sort of stuff. So yeah, I will, I'll show you some examples of that. Okay, and my other question is, um, you can implement exception handling without needing the knots and without needing the other tables, so why does the x64 need a knot in those funny cases you mentioned? Um, that gets into some weird details that I think are probably, I, I'd be more than happy to talk to you afterward. But there, there are some details about how Windows handles exceptions that I can, that I'd be more than happy to talk to you afterward about. Hey, um, Kevin. Yes. So you mentioned a few uh, direct costs of of EH, and and though you touched on this sort of indirect cost, which you say like phrases like constrain the optimizer, uh -huh. and I think I know what you mean, but maybe could you elaborate a little bit, or, or will you elaborate some more in? Okay, so I, there, there is some discussion of optimization constraints. Um, actually, next one. Let me see. There we go. Yeah, I will, I will get into it to some degree. But when I say, when I say optimization constraints, I'm talking about the kind of uh, Dragon Book style stuff. Anybody that's taken a compiler's course, um, you know, dead stores and common sub-expression elimination loop unrolling, all, all the kind of classical compiler optimization stuff. Let's see, where was it? Okay, so the language specific limitations, so C++, if you're going to implement a C++ conformant compiler, um, you have to have flow edges from any call site, any, any function call um, that might throw an exception. And that requires that variables that might have a value in one place and a different value after that call, you have to be able to recover that value. So we can't do, um, we have to uh, write memory, write values to memory so that if, it's, if it has to be recovered due to an exception, um, we don't lose that. It, you, can't, you can't just use registers for that sort of thing. Um, we have to do a little bit less constant propagation um, because of that. Some of the common sub-expressions that you would think you know, if I say i plus 2, and then after a call I say i plus 2, I may not be able to rely on the fact that i is the same value because I might have done something that modified that. Um, and so we have, to, we have to be careful about what values we're allowed to um, optimize for. Uh, so I mentioned the, the compiler flags. Yes? So, so does the compiler know which functions could throw exceptions? Um, so that would require some kind of global Yes, we have, we have uh, two modes of operation. We have a whole program uh, compilation model where we do have the entire program in memory at once. And we can know for all the source code that we have what throws and what doesn't. With, uh, that's actually only for EHS. 
So S, which is the C++ standard, we can look at all the source code and say there's a throw, and there's a throw, and there's a throw. Um, we also have uh, a decal spec that you can tag on your functions that's to indicate this thing doesn't throw an exception. So if you're not compiling your whole program at once, you can use those to indicate what functions if a, an exception will never come from. And we'll use that to say, oh, you know, we don't have to worry about um, keeping that value in memory because we know that, that except the, the function won't throw an exception. Are you, are you talking about throw specification? Yeah. Th uh, yeah. No, actually, we, we, so Visual C++ 8.0 does not um, implement the throw specification as the standard it requires. And in fact, the throw specification, um, the way that Microsoft has implemented it has led a lot of people to believe it's an optimization because we treat it like a decal spec no throw. So when you say, I don't throw anything, the Microsoft compiler says, okay, just treat it like it's never going to throw an exception. And in fact, if you say, according to the C++ standard, if you say, I don't throw anything, what you're really saying is, if I throw anything, I'm going to throw this exception instead. And so in order to really support that, you have anything that has a, an exception specification on it would have to have uh, a try-catch around it, basically. Um, at least mentally, that's what it has to do. So, um, yeah, we don't support exception specifications like the standard tells us to. Um, and that's kind of, we, we set a really bad precedent previously that we're kind of stuck with. Um, okay, so one detail of people that are migrating to, to uh, Visual Studio 2005 scenario, if you were using our old, compi our old compiler flags for exception handling, and you take an exception and suddenly you notice that your destructors aren't being invoked, um, that was by design. We changed the way that we handle exceptions in, in ADO because we used to use the EHS scenario, which is just pay attention to C++ throws, as a, well, we'll shrink stuff and we'll still handle, handle it if you have an AV, but you get these weird situations where your destructors might not get invoked because you took an AV and then you handled the AV and some of your destructors get, get called and some of them wouldn't. And in AO we said, all right, anybody that really expects to clean up from an, a, from, you know, an access violation or divide by zero, um, it should be obvious to them that they need to use EHA and not EHS. So EHS will only call destructors if you use C++ throw. If you call race exception, which is the Win32 <coughs> race exception thing, or if you divide by zero or go through a null pointer, none of your destructors will be invoked. Even if you have a try accept, the, or if you have a different function that was compiled to catch that thing, any of the functions that, that had live objects, those objects will just be orphaned. Um, QA people generally like this, and it really bothers developers. Um, basically, it exposes bugs really quickly, uh, relatively speaking. Exception handling bugs like to hang around in uh, code bases for a very long time as a recent experience with Vista uh, verifies. Uh, we, we found a compiler bug uh, very recently in Vista due to exception handling. My fault, so. so. Um, okay, so uh, the EHA ex extension, this is a Microsoft extension, and for that we always require that all destructors get invoked no matter if you take an AV, if you run out of stack space, um, if you divide by zero. And that results in a lot more flow arcs because that means really almost every instruction can raise an exception. So uh, we don't really build that many flow arcs. We have some optimizations in the compiler to, to reduce that. But mentally, you have to think there is potentially a flow arc into my catch block at every single instruction. And so we have to constrain a lot more optimizations in that space. Um, we Stack packing is a common, a, a really trivial way to um, increase your utilization of cache and get generally better code, we can't stack pack a lot of variables because we'll have um, two lifetimes that look like, well, this is i and this is j, and we can put them at the same place because they are they never are alive at the same time, but we really can't because later on they might be observed. And so we have to make sure that we don't stack pack those variables. Um, we can't do a lot of the constant propagation you'd normally think. If you assign to i, and then you assign to i a different value, even if you do really nothing except maybe you know star p, that star p could could uh, raise an exception. And so you can't assume that i equals zero and then i equals one. You can't get rid of that i equals zero because it might be observed. Um, so 
Uh, I did want to touch on a modifier we have. EHC, you mentioned how we, how we determine what throws an exception and what doesn't. So if you use our, our C++ conformant version and you, you do a whole program, we do a really good job of figuring out what can throw and what can't. Um, but if you are using DLLs, if you have entry points into other functions that we don't know about, um, EHC says assume they don't throw. And if you don't use EHC, we assume that they do throw. Um, and yeah, basically the entire Win32 API kind of falls under that class of it's an extern C function and they, none of them throw C++ exceptions. So it's generally a safe assumption to make, but if you're doing, uh, if you're building your own DLL and exporting values by, um, you know, by switching them over to extern C because you didn't want to deal with the name decoration or any of those other fun words we have, um, that's a, kind of a dangerous flag to throw. Kevin, do you want to say anything about com? Com. There. <laughs> wow. <laughs> well, so yeah, com is, com is uh, extern C, right? No. C++. So they, the, the optimizer assumes a com call could throw a C++ exception. Okay. So, so it can cause a lot of extra uh, code. So when a com calls, there. com calls look like could throw. Because they're C++ calls, so the extern C doesn't, doesn't apply okay. to them. Oh. Um, but the thing is that the specification is, is for com, they shouldn't throw exceptions, they always turn age results, et cetera, but as far as the compiler is concerned, right. they look like they could throw C++ exceptions. Right, so this modifier only applies to these extern C functions. So if you have a DLL that you're exporting through a C++ <coughs> header file and you're, you're, you're doing all the stuff that you know, we encourage, all of those functions, unless you use the decal spec no throw on them, they're all going to look like they can throw, even if they can't. And com is uh, apparently a big offender there. I, I don't do much common programming, mm -hmm. sorry. Thanks, Joan. Uh, okay, so um, the mandatory optimization constraints that we have, there's, there are a set of things that are really tied to the ABI that stands for Application Binary Interface. This is what my stack frame has to look like, how I unwind my stack, which registers are non-volatile, which ones are volatile, um, kind of the, you know, how, how I call functions on my, on, with my operating system on this particular chip. Um, for Win32 and Win64, tail calls are illegal inside of a try. Uh, so a tail call is where you say, it, anybody that's done functional programming knows, understands tail recursion completely. Uh, this is basically tail recursion. You look at, the, well, you're returning the result of a function call, so instead of calling and then returning, you just jump to that function and it'll automatically return. Uh, saves the stack space, saves you a couple of extra instructions, um, and you can't do it if you're inside a try block. You can't do it if you have a live object that needs to be destroyed before you return. Um, and so that's, that is one cost that, um, at least for Windows, we can't eliminate. Uh, it can increase stack usage significantly, uh, but the instruction level performance isn't a big deal typically because because modern architectures do a really good job of saying a call and a return, they, they can match them up pretty well and they're fast at that. Um, there are so, also some instruction scheduling constraints that uh, you, can't, you can't schedule most instructions into a try block, you don't want to generally schedule them out of a try block or an object lifetime. Um, again, on modern architectures, instruction scheduling in general buys you almost nothing. So there's not a, there's not a, a, a generally a win there. Um, so in VCAO, we have no impact on functions that have uh, some that don't contain any EH construct. So even if you're compiling EHA, if you don't have a try block in there, or if you don't have a C++ object with a destructor in there, there's no cost at all. Um, the problem with that, and I'll have an example later, is that sometimes you may expect a value uh, to be visible if you're modifying a global in a function that doesn't have uh, doesn't have any try block in it, but may raise an exception, you might want to observe a state of a variable that we've optimized away. Um, I'll, I'll go into details there uh, a little bit later, I'll have an example for that. So there are, there are some gotchas there. Um, that's also only an issue for the Microsoft extension so that we can support AVs, that sort of thing. For C++, if you have a throw, we realize that, you know, if I said I equals zero, you know, if blah, throw, I equals one, we realize that that, that value of I may be visible, so we take care of that for you. Um, one of the 
one of the arguments for this, uh, against exception handling, has to do with this. Oh, look at how my optimizations are constrained. Because I'm using this, I'm going to use something else instead. Well, there's a whole bunch of things you can do in the language that cost you, that a lot, a lot of people don't realize. Allocate costs you. Set jump and long jump, if you're using these uh, for, you know, this is kind of old school exception handling in C, that costs you. Uh, a lot of the decal specs that we support cost you. If you're, if you're uh, using our, our security buffer checks, that has performance um, issues. Our floating point model, if you care about floating point accuracy, there are all sorts of things that you can do in your code that have these, have costs. And you need to understand them all and not just focus on one. The floating point model, for example, if you care about floating point accuracy, you make sure that you understand the trade-offs. Um, that's really, I mean, that's been the typical argument for exception handling is, oh, it costs so much, but a lot of people do that and then they'll turn around and use allocates left and right or set jump and long jump. And the costs there are, um, equally, can be equally bad. In the worst cases can be similar. Um, so to get just details of the, of the uh, 2005 compiler, we turn off late flow optimizations for AMD64. That generally winds up uh, increasing code size a little bit, which can have construction cache penalties and that sort of thing, but it doesn't have too much of a performance impact generally. Um, we also disable our loop optimizer. Um, for any function with a try block. This isn't functions with objects and um, objects with destructors, but if you have a try block, all loops inside that inside that function, not just inside the try block, will be left alone. We don't unroll them, uh, we don't we don't uh, do strength reduction on them, uh, at least most of the loop loop level strength reduction. We just leave the loops alone. And that one is probably the single biggest issue. Um, so if you do have Yes? Why is that? <laughs> Why? Uh, our loop optimizer is not the best loop optimizer in the industry. Um, and we, in order to support the structured exception handling model, there are, you, you almost have to do this anyway. Um, because you wind up changing the way that exceptions could manifest. If you do induction variables, um, you might wind up accidentally dereferencing something that walked off the end of a, an array. And generally, that's OK. Um, but you can't do it because someone might observe that things are ordered differently. Loop unrolling, um, I think loop unrolling is really just uh, we ran out of time. But the, I mean, we have to ship a product, so this is the cost right now. Um, prior, we used to turn off stack packing completely. And that was actually probably more measurable than most people's code. Um, that's changed. We actually uh, stack pack any variables that don't occur inside a try block, and then we do a, a very good job of figuring out which variables need to be um, visible in the catch block. Anything that's live and could be observed, we do a really good job of figuring out which ones we can optimize and which ones we can't. Um, prior to BC8, that's probably the biggest performance penalty you'll see um, out of Visual Studio compilers. <coughs> Um, so, I, this is really abstract, and uh, so I think a lot of people are kind of glazed over. Uh, he's not glazed over, but most are. <laughs> um, um, so I wanted to I wanted to actually show some source code because I think it's a lot easier to look at source code. And I mean, most C++ programmers eventually hit some amount of disassembly, and it's really interesting to be able to see exactly the disassembly that I mean. I, I talked really abstractly. Oh, there's a prologue cost. There's an epilogue cost. So I have three functions here. And I'll argue that they are functionally identical. They handle the exact same situation. They call an init function, then they call foobar and blah. And if an exception is raised in foobar and blah, they will invoke done anyway. And if an exception isn't invoked, they will call done and then return. Um, so in C++, you do this with RAII. Um, we have a, an object with init in its constructor, a done in its destructor, and then we just call foobar and blah. And then if you uh, don't use exception handling at all, you just have a result. You check your results. Um, if you have a result, you have to handle your, your failure case. Um, anybody disagree that these are functionally equivalent? Everybody agree? Yes. All right. um, so here's what x86 generates. Uh, O2 is the compiler flag to say, uh, optimize the hell out of it. Make this thing really fast. Um, so I kind of colored stuff here. The red. Oh, you can't tell. Oh, it's purple. Oh, come on. Not going to work. Cable. 
Um, so the, the kind of orangish, reddish stuff, that's the prologue. So this is what is invoked before you ever hit any of your code. And uh, so we, we set up the stack frame, we have a frame pointer, and then all these pushes and moves and stuff, that is how x86 on Win32 handles exceptions. We have a global, we have a thread local linked list of things that have to be cleaned up. So we push an element on that linked list, and then we finish our stack allocation, and then, we, then this is the point at which you call your function. So we have nine instructions. We have nine instructions. Uh, one of them is actually kind of costly. The fs colon zero is not necessarily cheap. Um, and then we call an int. And after we've called an int, then we do this uh, enter the try block. So we, set, we assign zero to this weird SEH rec thing. That just says, hey, I'm in a try block now. And we call foobar blah. And then we come back, and in order to exit the try block, we have to set negative one to this, this uh, weird uh, stack element. And then we call this finally funklet. And the finally funklet is we've taken that done call, and we've moved it into a completely separate function. And so we'll call done, and then we return. So you come back up here. And then this is your epilogue. So all the stuff in that gross orange color is overhead. That's what it takes just to get into the function and get out. Um, and then the blue is uh, overhead of entering a try block and exiting a try block. Um, this is 01. And this is uh, our, oh, yes? Back one slide. What's the purpose of the function? Why can't you just call done? Um, we could call done, and that's an implementation, that's an implementation choice. The reason it's a funklet is because a finally also has to be invocable by the unwinder. So when we're cleaning, if we throw an exception, we have to provide some mechanism to call that thing um, from a different context. So we have to be able to call done if an, if an exception occurs. And so we could, in fact, in, in this situation, it's just really a dumb optimizer. We could have just said call done right there, right? And in fact, um, AMD64, that's what we do. But we still have to have this little piece of code sitting somewhere and accessible so that if an exception occurs, this thing gets called. Okay, so 01 is the compiler flag that says, optimize it really well, but don't bloat the code. Make it small and fast. So when we say make it small, we have a little helper that shrinks our, uh, shrinks our prologues and epilogues. And other than that, the code looks just the same. So it's a little bit slower, but You'll find it inside the SEH prologue and SEH epilogue helpers. Um, there's, a, it's basically the same amount of code, we, so we have a little bit of overhead, but we get better eye cache performance if you have a lot of these things. And we found that generally code size does tend to matter. Um, okay. Okay, so for x86 C++, um, it looks pretty similar actually. You've got uh, the, the uh, prologue, it's actually a little bit smaller. Um, then we have this push ECX, and this is uh, a weakness in the optimizer because that object uh, doesn't ever use its this pointer, but we allocate space for it anyway. So that's what push ECX is doing. Um, then we call it it, and then we have this enter try and exit try thing around our foo bar blah calls. And then um, we have done the optimization you mentioned. Done is called directly right there. Um, so we inline the destructor, and then we pop that element, so this is our epilogue. Um, the done call still exists elsewhere. We still have that other funklet, but that's moved to the end of your image, and hopefully will never be paged in. If you don't take an exception, you'll never bring that code into memory. Um, for 01, we, we kind of do the same optimization. We have this little helper. It's not quite as big a win in C++. It, buys you like two instructions instead of four. Um, but basically it's the, the same kind of code. Uh, so the, the non-exception handling version, uh, here's, the, here's the whole code, and actually 01 and 02 are identical. Um, we, have, we, have a, uh, we have to save ESI because we have a return value, and we register that thing so we can keep track of it. So that's kind of overhead for this version. You have an extra variable sitting there. So we call init, we call foo error. If you look at all of these jumps and whatnot, um, they're modeling flow that is 
hopefully uncommon if this is if you're trying to handle exceptions. This is this is the error their error cleanup code. Um, so we've we've uh, reused done, so we don't have this thing existing anywhere else. We just have a single call to our cleanup code, and if we pass, we set our return value in ESI and we jump into the fail code. Um, but it's returning. It's going to return that value, so we move ESI into EAX and return it out. Um, but we do have uh, a couple of compares and uh, tests, I guess. We do a couple of tests, we do a couple of uh, branches. Um, I think this code is actually smaller, <coughs> and it'll probably run a little bit faster. Uh, but the code looks a little bit messier, so you kind of have to decide, you know, what do you like? Do you like maybe cleaner source code, or do you like um, tighter assembly? Uh, so for oh that's so that's the end of the x86 stuff and I know x86 relatively well um, x64 is uh, my specialty I was involved in this compiler from day one and the x64 design we took a completely different approach so instead of trying to make people pay whenever you use try and accept we wanted to make it really cheap to use exceptions as long as you don't raise them if you don't ever throw an exception um, x64 tends to be much more optimal. So in this situation, we have a prologue there that uh, just allocates 40 bytes. Um, we have to have 40 bytes because our stack's 30 or 16 bit by a line, and we have to have space for the calls. We have to have 32 bytes for each call. So we've got the sub RSP that's <coughs> overhead. Then we call in it, and there, then there's that no opt that uh, is you see those occasionally. And they're almost free, single byte. Uh, and then we call through our block, we have another no-op, we call done, so that the AMD64 compiler has done the inlining thing for you, instead of putting it, doing a, a, an ex, a separate call. Then we um, get rid of our stack frame and return. Uh, that's the same for size or speed, it's hard to make that any smaller. Uh, for C++, we do have one extra cost, and that's that uh, it's a weird little negative two I mentioned earlier. Uh, C++ has a really awful um, feature called disassociated rethrows that uh, you can, in anywhere in your code, just say throw. No arguments, anything like that. And if that code is called from inside a catch, we have to be able to rethrow the, the object that was caught. Um, the reason it's called disassociated is because in the source code it is unclear which object is being rethrown. So in order to handle appropriately destroying the exception objects and that sort of thing, we have to have this little helper on the stack. Uh, it's pretty hideous and there's like a year of my life in that one instruction. <laughs> um, so, so we allocate a little bit more stack space um, and that's actually stupidity. We could probably uh, allocate a little less than we need, than we actually do. Um, we have the same two no ops, but actually for C++, um, our object is inline and tail call. So our object destructor, we, we originally would do a call done and then ret, but we're actually able to tail call that thing. So you, instead of having a call um, and a ret, you just do the jump there. Uh, that's something that we can't do for structure exception handling that we can do for C++ and X64. Uh, and here's the no EH version. And I think, I think on x64 it's a lot clearer which one tends to be faster if you're not throwing exceptions. Um, you have a pretty standard stack frame setup, uh, stack frame cleanup, and then a whole lot of flow and a lot more instructions. Um, on the on the AMD64 side, I don't think it's a very convincing argument to say I want to check my return values uh, unless you're throwing lots of exceptions. But if you're not throwing exceptions commonly, uh, if you're porting Win64 or you're writing new code on Win64, um, C++ exception handling is a very good idea. Um, so that's kind of the end of the cost of not ever throwing an exception, but just using them in case. Uh, so now I'm stepping into uh, my pet peeve. Of, if you care about how much it costs to handle an exception, you're not you're using them in common cases. Because you know, if you ran out of stack space, something's going on, and there, there's other performance problems. So if this is a performance concern for you, you should really look at your design of 
look at how you're using exception handlings and try and figure out, is that really the right way to do it? Um, they're not to deal with standard scenarios. If you hit the end of your linked list, don't throw an exception to indicate it. You know, that's, that's, a, that's a standard scenario. Uh, there's a reason it's called an exception. Um, so this is very, very nitty gritty Windows implementation stuff. It's dramatically different on Unix. Uh, I don't actually know completely how it's implemented on Unix, but I know that C++ exceptions in Unix land are the cost and the way that they're um, thrown, the way that they're handled, are completely different from this. Um, so on x86, Win30, just as a disclaimer, so people don't go off and write their Unix code and complain to me that, you know, oh, but it was faster or too slow or whatever. Um, for Win32, uh, on x86, we have, we have this mechanism that was put out in, I think, 7.1, or possibly 8.0, called Safe SEH. Um, there's, a, there's a pretty bad security hole in the x86 implementation where, uh, actually, if you looked on my source code, you could see it. Um, that second push, we've just pushed a function pointer on the stack right below your return address. So we, there's all this stuff to make sure that your return address isn't obliterated. And it's really easy to check that because we know right before you call, you, you return, we can check that value and say, oh, you, you know, you changed the cookie, so you must have had a buffer overrun. Exceptions, if you overrun your buffer, it's really easy to make an exception. And we can't tell that you're going to raise an exception. And so there's this little function pointer sitting there that's just, it's a honeypot. It looks marvelous to anybody that's trying to write uh, write code that's going to take over a machine. Um, so, that said, I'll talk about the non-safe SEH, but don't do this. Use safe SEH. It's a flag to the linker. Um, it, it basically identifies all those functions to the, to the OS, so the OS will only call functions that are identified as valid handlers, so it won't call people's code that's sitting on your stack, or call arbitrary code in you know, a system DLL. It will only call the handlers that are identified as, hey, this thing can be called if an exception occurs. Um, anyway, so if you don't use it, uh, you can handle an exception in O of n time, where n is the number of tries or objects on the stack between the throw and the catch. So if you have a call, and you call 57,000 functions, and you're way down here, and you throw, and there's nothing in between, it costs you, you know, a few cycles to get up to that top catch and handle your exception. Um, we just lock this linked list, and the linked list is only built if your function has an exception in it. Um, so when we, when we walk that list, uh, we call filters to say, hey, should you handle the exception or not? And once we find who's going who's gonna to handle the exception, we go back and we start calling destructors until we get to that point. Um, so we just call final list of destructors, and then we jump to an accept block, or we call the catch block, and that's it. It's very, very fast. Um, if you use safe SEH, this slows down a bit. It's, it's O of n log m, where n is the same number. It's how many frames on the stack actually have this. And then m is the number of exception handling entry points you have in your code. And that's different. For SEH, there's only one. It's, I think it's the C-specific handler. So log one is pretty cheap. Um, actually, what is log one? That's zero, so that's not quite accurate. All right, it's a little bigger than that. But, um, for C++, each funklet is identified. And so if you have a lot of destructors and a lot of catch blocks, um, each one of those different funklets gets identified. And so this is potentially a pretty large number, it's, but they're sorted, so it's a binary search. Uh, it does slow down measurably, but it's generally not too bad. And would you really rather have your customers complain that hackers have taken over other machines? Probably not. Uh, okay, so, and then once it's, once it, uh, so the OS just checks to make sure, oh, is this a valid entry point before it calls it, and it's that check that costs um, performance. So on x64, um, the performance for handling exception is much worse. And this was, uh, this was an intentional decision. We said we want to allow people to write code that is exception safe, and if they don't take exceptions, it should run lightning fast. We don't want them to have any cost associated with it. And if they take an exception, all bets are off. So uh, it's, uh, the algorithm to actually handle exceptions is O of n log m as well, but n and m are a little bit different. n is actually the number of functions. So in my previous example, if you have a function up here, 
and you call 50,000 functions deep, and you throw it out here, you have to unwind each one of those functions. So even though they don't have any exception handling in them, we have to step through the whole stack. And then M is the number of regions in your entire executable or DLL. And that's normally, it's generally on the order of the same number of functions you have in your DLL or, or XE, but it can be higher than that because we use these regions for some, to describe some uh, optimizations. Uh, we shrink wrap, which has to do with pushing register saves and restores into different places in the, in the function. Um, it's generally one to four times the number of functions you have in your, uh, in your entire DLL or XE. So we walk each function frame on the stack, and that is not a cheap operation because we're actually interpreting some metadata that says where my non-volatile registers are saved so that we, we can recover the frame pointer prep properly. And uh, we find its P data entry, which is this sorted list of these regions to say, oh, where am I? I found, I found that I'm at offset you know, 5,000 hex. What function am I in? And from there, we invoke handlers, um, or we check to see where the handler is, and then we go back and walk it again. And I believe there's a cache so that we're not doing all of the interpretation of this metadata again, but it's not cheap. Um, the comparing x64, how many exceptions you can throw and catch per second to x86 is a couple of orders of magnitude off. Um, and so if you port to 64-bit and you see that sort of thing, you should look at your exception usage. Um, so I mentioned before that this stuff is really ABI specific. Uh, and architecture specific. So Win64 has a mode where we can run 32-bit apps. In fact, this is a 64-bit laptop and I'm running 32-bit PowerPoint on it. Um, that scenario actually is not a normal Win32 scenario and it's not a normal Win64 scenario. We're running a subsystem under the 64-bit kernel and there's some amount of thunking between 32-bit and 64-bit. And so when you, if, even if you're running your 32-bit apps, if somebody's running that on a 64-bit OS, the performance of exception handling can be different. And worst case, it is as slow as the x64 version. Um, best case, it's about as the same as x86. And that, that's about the limit of my knowledge on this. I've seen both extremes, and most stuff falls somewhere in the middle. But even if you're on Win32, if you have customers that are looking at Vista on x64 or running XP64, they may wind up seeing some weird performance. Um, exception handling can, can cause this kind of issue. Uh, and I'm, I really do hate it when people care about how fast exceptions can be handled. If you care, you're doing bad things. Unless your hardware is in really bad shape or something. Um, so I mentioned earlier that there are some gotchas with uh, our, our structured exception handling and handling AVs and stack overflows and that sort of thing. And the fact that you don't pay for it unless you have a try catch. Well, here's, here's the code that you'll wind up having problems with. If you, have a, if you have a function that's called inside of a try, that function can be optimized because we don't think it's really being called inside of a try. Even if we have whole program optimizations on, we won't look at update and say, oh, update is being invoked inside of this try block. So when you look at this code, it looks the exact same, except this is called inside of a try and that one or th these are invoked directly inside of try, and that one we're calling a function. But the optimizer, when it says that, sees that g equals 1 and then g equals 2, will never store 1 to g. Because we just look at that and say, well, this is stupid. We're assigning 1 and then we're assigning 2, and we're not doing anything interesting in between. Yes? Would it align that function, though? Well, yes. So uh, they're constrained inside of try in observable differences based on program structure. That's what's here. Compiler settings in lining and compiler implementation. So if we inline update into that try block, which we tend to not because we view inlining into tries as a bad idea because of the additional cost, but sometimes we do. If we inline that, it'll work. But if we don't, it won't work. So these two programs are really different when you're using structured exceptions. Um, and I'd also like to point out, you will not have this problem with C++. Because that's star p, the language defines that as undefined. So that's, this is an undefined program in C++, standard C++. 
you'd have to say throw invalid program exception or something like that. And at that point, we'll say, hey, there's a throw here, so we better write one to the value g and then write two to it. Um, the alternative is to make g a volatile. And if you mark it volatile, then we will always write to it. Uh, however, whenever you use g, then you're going to have that, that kind of performance issue. Um, that's pretty much it. Um, I've, I've been doing exception handling, well, up until about two years ago, this was kind of what I really did in the compiler. My, my primary job in AV64 was implementation of this stuff. And a lot of people have a lot of kind of misgivings about it. C++ exception handling is actually a really elegant way to deal with non-standard flow. Please keep that in mind. You don't want to use exceptions in the normal case. But on AV64 in particular, performance is very good. In x86, the performance penalties um, are enough that instead of worrying about should I use exceptions or should I not, you should maybe look at it from you know, the project. Is, does it make sense? Am I going to need some sort of way to report errors to other people too, that they might not be able to accept exceptions? Or um, is it going to be too, too much of a learning curve? Am I going to have a lot of new people coming in and they're not going to be able to follow this code or that code? There's a lot more important concerns than how much C++ exception handling costs. It's not, it's not really any additional cost over writing the same kind of code that, at the same level of quality um, without using it. So when you're trying to, if you're, you know, if you're involved in making decisions about this, this shouldn't be a deciding factor. This should be a peripheral thing that maybe influences your decision, but don't just say, well, it's, it's too slow or we have to use it because otherwise we're not going to, there, there are more important concerns. Um, and there's, uh, if you do have questions about the x64 ABI, um, I probably know more about it than anybody except the Windows kernel people. Um, so I, I uh, answer questions on my blog, there's a whole bunch of random docs there. Um, and Herb Sutter does have some good books on exception handling and how to use it and kind of design around it. Um, and he doesn't give me kickbacks, they are good books, I promise. Before we jump into questions too much. Um, I'm going to be walking around collecting the forms for the Compella drawing, which is a $75 gift certificate at Best Buy. If you didn't receive a, um, a form, go ahead and raise your hand, and Jeff will come around and... Sorry. Yeah. No. Yeah. You said that the, you push a, a keyword onto the stack on x64. How does yes. that affect the alignment of the stack or the keyword? Uh, we can push a D word or a Q word or whatever because we push and then we align the stack. So yeah, we, we do always, the stack is always aligned. Um, the ABI requires that the only section where the stack is aligned is in the first 256 bytes of the function and we have to describe that very, very clearly. That's the, that's the metadata I was talking about actually where we say, okay, we pushed, a, we pushed eight bytes, we subtracted some amount from the RSP, and so we describe that in, in this uh, little meta language that we have. Um, yes. Did, did you measure like performance improvements with the with the new exceptions and the design of the uh, new before? So, so the um, the question was, do we measure performance improvements compared yeah, to x86 like, like, and AV64? Maybe there is some Uber application that really uses exception handling and you compile it before you compile it. After. So, um, the Uber application is named SQL. Okay. Uh, <laughs> SQL Server 2005 uses exceptions frequently, right. and they saw some performance penalties. I don't know much about Itanium. I've tried to avoid it because it's big and scary. But the Itanium ABI, uh, the way they handle exceptions, is very similar to AMD64, except their meta language is a lot more costly to interpret. And so the SQL team, when they started looking at 64-bit perf in general, this was a big thing. Um, and they did a little bit of re-architecture, so they're only throwing compilers, they're throwing exceptions a few times a second, and instead of hundreds and thousands of times a second. Uh, but I, and I have to, I have to be, uh, I have to be honest. I don't know exactly how they're using them anymore. I haven't paid attention, but I know when they were initially ramping up, this was a cost. Um, I've seen some really interesting, and creative ways of using exceptions. Um, the Win32 structured exception handling allows you to do really cool stuff. You can actually implement, implement um, uh, write once pages using structured exception handling. I've seen some really creative uses of that to do massive undo buffering. You can actually implement poor man's transactional memory using this stuff. Uh, 
And if you do that, you'll find that in x86, you get certain performance characteristics. And in x64, you get completely unrelated performance characteristics. Um, we, haven't, we haven't really had too many customers complain about this. Generally, it's been, OK, we'll re-architect a little bit. You know, the problem with C++ exception handling is that it's hard to know where to put a try and catch. And um, the, most, the, the code that uses it that I've seen that works well, that's maintainable, they have little tiny tries and catches where they care about, and then they just have one big one out at the end. And anything in the middle is really, it's, it's a hard problem to keep track of. It tends to get intractable. Um, so, but again, I mean, this is, this is team, this is like team strengths and weaknesses. You need to understand what your people are good at following what they're not. Um, exceptions are really powerful. And, you know, like my C++ professor used to say, C++ is an adult language. We give people a gun, and if they aim it at their foot and pull the trigger, you know, that's, they, maybe they need to shoot their foot off. Any other questions? Yes? So if I'm a compiler vendor, or a JIT vendor, or if I write ASM functions that call to C functions, how do I know how to write PData? or this little meta language that you've described? Uh, you have to search MSDN, but honestly, it's easier to go to my blog. <laughs> and there's links from my blog to that documentation. Um, yeah, there is, there is information about how to generate this. I have, I have links to the ABI from my blog uh, that goes into kind of really awkward and difficult to understand descriptions of this stuff. Um, please feel free to contact me. Stick a, uh, my email alias is kfree, K-F-R-E-I, at Microsoft. Um, bug me. I'm, I'm happy to answer questions. There have been enough compiler vendors that have successfully targeted this stuff without talking to me for more than five minutes that I think it's, the information is there and, and digestible. But yeah, if you're, you know, the JIT thing is really quite important actually. There's a lot of people that do little code generators. Um, it, I've been surprised at how many people will uh, have something that maybe generates a function on the fly. Uh, just for little tiny things here and there. If you do that on AMD 64, you have to obey these rules or your process will terminate when an exception is thrown. Um, another big hint is Windows Win32 programmers are accustomed to stack walks not working. So they see the first frame, first five frames of their stack and then the debugger says, frames below may be unreadable, something like that. And it's awful and everybody hates it, but everybody's accustomed to it. If you ever see that on AMD64, your code's broken. The stacks are always unwindable on AMD64. So if you're generating assembly functions and you're calling these things and your stack looks screwed up, you need to fix your assembly. Yeah? Do you use C++ exceptions in the code you write? Personal code? Yeah, I do. <laughs> I do not use C++ exceptions in my professional code because the C++ optimizer is written in C. So. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much, Kevin.